Well, how many of you are getting excited about uh, the Passover Seder on Monday evening? <laughs> Our 11th year in a row hosting this Passover Seder. Praise God. And as we all know, we have many uh, different uh, congregations of different denominations. They come to the Passover Seder, but at that Seder, praise the Lord, we're all one. We're all one body. And it's just an exciting time. I hope that uh, you can be there. Now, I was praying about uh, the teaching for this Shabbat, and you know, I've given many, many different teachings on the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, in the past, and Passover is uh, pronounced in Hebrew Pesach. Everyone say Pesach. Pesach. And Unleavened Bread is Chag Hamatzot. Everyone? That's hug, not hog. Let's keep it kosher. <laughs> and uh, in one of the teachings, we've seen how Yeshua fulfilled all the Torah requirements in uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 12, to be our Passover lamb. Remember, Yeshua is the Torah made flesh. Every jot and tittle of the Torah is the spiritual DNA of the Messiah, the Word made flesh. And I would recommend you uh, do a, uh, a thorough reading of Exodus chapter 12 later. But in Exodus 12, we see that uh, the Israelites were instructed to uh, select a lamb that was out blemish, without spot, or without defect in Exodus 12, verse 5. And this all pointed to the Messiah who was sinless, without defect, without blemish. And it's interesting that the father of the household uh, in uh, during the time when the Israelites were about to leave Egypt, when that lamb was selected, the father had to inspect it very closely to make sure that there was nothing wrong with it. And it's really something how Yeshua himself was inspected by many. They all tried to find something wrong with him, such as the Pharisees. They always were trying to uh, prove him wrong by trapping him with some of their questions, but he always answered a question with a question, which is good Jewish thinking, by the way. And uh, he always silenced them. So, in reality, they couldn't find anything wrong. We know that Pontius Pilate even said, I find nothing wrong with this man. Even Judas Iscariot, who betrayed the Messiah, when he threw the 30 pieces of silver back into the temple, he exclaimed, I have betrayed innocent blood. The repentant cross thief said to the other cross thief, we deserve the punishment that we are getting, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then the Roman centurion, after Yeshua uh, was crucified and died, remember the temple veil was torn asunder, and there were supernatural manifestations, and the Roman centurion said, surely this man was the Son of God, again indicating Yeshua's perfection. They all tried to find something wrong with him, but they couldn't because he was the Passover Lamb of God. Also, Exodus chapter 12, verse 3 tells us that the lambs were chosen on the 10th of Nisan, that is um, four days before the 14th of Nisan, four days before Passover, and this exactly was when Yeshua uh, appeared as the Lamb of God riding into Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan. It also says in Exodus 12, 6, that the lambs were to be slaughtered at twilight, but in the original Hebrew it reads, Bein Ha'arbayim, which means between the two evenings, exactly when Yeshua died, according to Luke 23, verse 44 through 46, between the two evenings, 
during the ninth hour of the day. Also, Exodus 12, verse 6 says that the lambs were to be killed by the entire Israelite community. And that points toward all of us as sinners. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all responsible for the Messiah's death. And Exodus 12, verse 46 says that not a bone of the Passover lamb was to be broken. And this prophetically points again to a Yeshua. Remember that the uh, legs of the two cross thieves were broken, but not the legs of Yeshua, the Lamb of God. We've also seen in the past how he was crucified, Yeshua was crucified at the very same hour as the Passover lambs were being sacrificed at the temple, according to the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 14 through 18. And this is also very interesting. We've seen how uh, Yeshua fulfilled the custom of keeping Passover on the first two nights of the feast. Traditionally, there is a, uh, a Passover Seder held on the 14th and then again on the 15th of Nisan. And that was a custom that arose due to the uncertainty of when the new moon of that month, in this case Nisan, was officially sighted. So they spread it out over two days. John 18, verse 28, in connection with that, says that the non-believing Jews wouldn't enter Pilate's praetorium, which was a court of the Gentiles. Remember, the Gentiles were considered unclean in the first century. And the non-believing Jews wouldn't enter Pilate's praetorium after Yeshua was arrested the night before, uh, on the first night, for fear that they, the non-believing Jews, would be defiled and not be able to keep the Passover on the second night. But this enabled Yeshua to honor the Torah by keeping the Seder on the first night with his Talmudim, with his disciples, where he instituted the Brit HaDashah, the New Covenant, and also to sacrifice his life at the same time with the Passover lambs that were sacrificed on the following evening. Mark 15, verse 25, tells us how his suffering began during the third hour of the day, that is the time of the shakarit, or the morning sacrifice, and also, again, from Luke 23, 44 through 46, how he died during the ninth hour of the day, which was the time of the mincha, or the evening sacrifice, thus fulfilling a commandment of Torah again to offer a lamb without blemish in the morning and in the evening. It says Exodus 29, verse 39. It's just amazing. You know, the more you read the Torah, the more you see Yeshua in it, how he fulfilled everything. We further have looked at his passion to be our Passover lamb. Even saying to his disciples in Luke 22, verse 15, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And Yeshua, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he still fervently desires to dine with us. Revelation 3, verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him, and he with me. He still fervently desires to celebrate the Passover with us. Now as we move on to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we've seen how Yeshua fulfilled that feast as well, for he is the bread of life, the true bread which came down from heaven, the bread that a man may eat of and never die, Not literally speaking about eating his flesh, which some believe in certain circles. It's called transubstantiation. We do not support that here. But rather, that we feed upon the word of God made flesh in Yeshua. The one who was sinless, yet he became the bread of affliction for us, fulfilling Deuteronomy 16, verse 3, where unleavened bread is compared to the bread of affliction. And how many of you have ever taken a real close look at the piece of matzah? Raise your hand. 
If you have, you will see that it is pierced, it is bruised, and it is striped, fulfilling the picture of God's suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 53. God's suffering servant who was pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed. <coughs> Isaiah 53 verse 11 also adds that he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied, and that is speaking of the resurrection of the Messiah. Furthermore, we've seen how Yeshua actually removed the leaven from his father's house in Matthew 21 verse 12 and 13. When did he do that? Shortly before Passover, actually on the 10th of Nisan when he entered into Jerusalem overthrowing the tables of money, quoting from Isaiah 56, verse 7, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves and robbers. So that's kind of like a just a quick review of some of the teachings. And by the way, for an in-depth teaching of uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you can get the CD from April 9, 2011. It goes into much more detail. And by the way, before I forget this, as a Torah observant congregation, we need to remember to remove all leaven products from our homes, preferably, preferably by a sundown tomorrow evening. Now in today's teaching, let's see how the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread, which are woven together, are clearly for Jew and Gentile, for all of us as all the biblical festivals are. In Hebrew, Moedim, God's appointed times and seasons. They're not just Jewish festivals, they're God's festivals, and we're all invited. He wants us all there. Praise the Lord. So let's look at that as we first uh, find 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in the Brit HaDashah. And after you found 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in the New Covenant, I'd like you to go back, keep your finger there, and then go back to Numbers chapter 9 in the Torah. stranger in Hebrew, it reads ger. If a stranger dwells among you and would keep the Lord's Passover, he must do so according to the rite of the Passover and according to its ceremony, you shall have one ordinance both for the stranger, the ger, and the native of the land, the native-born Israelite. Flip forward a few pages to Numbers chapter 15. Where it's repeated again, Numbers 15, verse 15 and 16. One ordinance shall be for you of the assembly and for the stranger, the Gair, who dwells with you in ordinance forever throughout your generations. You know, when God says it's an ordinance forever, he means it's an ordinance forever. Bukat Olam, an everlasting statue. As you are, meaning the Israelite, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. One law, one Torah, and one custom, mishpat in Hebrew, shall be for you and for the stranger who dwells with you. And now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. And Paul is writing to the Gentile believers in Corinth. And he says, Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, 
but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So as we examine these scriptures, both in the uh, Torah and in the New Covenant, clearly we see that the uh, observation of the Feast of Passover and unleavened bread is for all of us. It's for Jew and Gentile. For all Gentiles who are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. How many of you are glad you've been grafted into the root of that olive tree? Praise the Lord. This is also uh, repeated again in regards to the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, in Exodus 12, verse 17 through 20, where the Lord says, For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, where the native born or the stranger, no leaven shall be found in your houses. And so we need to literally uh, observe this mitzvah, and you've heard it before. Um, we need to remove the unleavened bread the 11 products from our homes and eat only leavened bread from the 14th to the 21st of the month of Nisan. Now in spite of all these scriptures, there are still, listen carefully, still some certain non-Jewish or Gentile believers who are very much uh, into following the Torah non-Jewish believers within the Torah movement itself who believe that they, as Gentiles, are banned, are not allowed to keep a Seder based upon what the Torah says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 43 through 48. And here's where we need to dig deep into the Hebrew text and find out exactly what God is saying in Exodus 12, verses 43 through 49. So let's turn there, please, to Exodus chapter 12. And let's begin with verse 43. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. Underline that word, Passover. No foreigner, underline the word foreigner, shall eat it. But every man's servant, highlight that as well, every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. So this individual here, uh, in verse 43 and verse 44 is actually tied together, and I'll explain that in a moment. Verse 45, a sojourner, underline the word sojourner, and a hired servant, highlight hired servant, shall not eat it. And now let's go to verse 48. And when a stranger, underline the word stranger, dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as a native of the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat it, meaning the Passover. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. So, at first glance, it would appear that the Torah is saying that unless a person is circumcised by a Jewish person and had made a formal conversion to Judaism, well then, they cannot celebrate the Passover. And I know it's easy for us to uh, right away start spiritualizing what the Torah says here and even get away from the original text by saying, okay, well, Yeshua, he's, he's the Israelite. He's the Hebrew who circumcised my heart. Or we might quote Paul from Galatians 3.28, it says, In Yeshua, in him there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free. Furthermore, didn't Paul say in Romans chapter 2, True circumcision is of the heart and not of the flesh, that a true Jew is one who is circumcised inwardly and not outwardly. And yes, these things are all true. But hallelujah and hallelujah, 
as a spirit-filled, Torah-observant, Messianic Jewish congregation on fire for Yeshua, praise the Lord, we need to take a closer look at the original Hebrew text in Exodus 12 and its literal meaning, which I believe will make things clearer to us. In verses 43, 45, and 48, Three separate Hebrew words are used in reference to one who is a non-Israelite. The first one, or the first category, in Hebrew would be a ben nechar. Everyone say ben, ben. nechar, which means son of a stranger. And the second category in Hebrew is a toshav. Everyone say toshav. <laughs> and then the third category, which we're most familiar with, is one who is a ger. Everyone say ger. Yeah. In plural, boyim. So in verse 43, it reads in the original text, ben necher, which means son of a stranger. It comes from the uh, noun nochri. But it actually is describing someone who is totally alien and needs to be totally excluded, generally used in describing Israel's enemies and those who are from the nations who are steeped in idolatry and foreign customs and worshiping foreign gods. One who is completely alienated from God's Torah, actually viewed as dangerous and hostile and apostate, Forbidden to make a Passover unless, everyone say unless, unless he became a slave of an Israelite and has consented to be circumcised in the flesh, according to verse 44, and then take on the Abrahamic faith. That's the first category. The second word used in verse 45 again is toshav. I had you underline this, which means a sojourner or a transient. Compared with a hired hand or a hired wage earner. Meaning someone who's just temporarily passing through the community of Israel looking for personal benefit. Meaning they have no commitment, no heart of Ruth, no understanding or caring of being grafted in or dwelling within the gates of God's chosen, chosen people. Again, a hireling looking for a prophet. P-R-O-F-I-T. And then the third word used in verse 48 is ger. And this is a non-Israelite who lives among the Jewish community, one who is subject to the same Torah as the native-born Israelite and is glad to be, hallelujah, regarded as one within the people of Israel, grafted into the olive tree of Israel, if you will, one who has the heart of Ruth, and the Gair enjoys the same rights, the privileges, and responsibilities as the native-born Israelite. Again, they are glad to be part of the Jewish community. It's not that I have to, but hallelujah, I get to. Amen. Praise the Lord. Somebody say, not that I have to. But hallelujah. hallelujah. I want to hear you say wow, hallelujah. Wow, hallelujah. And glory, hallelujah. glory hallelujah. I get to. I get to be grafted in to the household of Israel. Hallelujah. And if you believe that, give the Lord a very big clap. if you will, these verses in Exodus 12, verse 43 through 48. And this is part of uh, uh, the admonition in the scripture to rightly divide the word of truth. If you want the truth, you got to dig deep. Right. Amen? Amen? Now let's take these three categories a step further and make a more up-to-date analysis or a more current analysis. The first category again was a ben nechar the son of a stranger, an alien, completely alienated from Israel and God's Torah, could very well represent 
people today, even some believers today, who operate under the spirit of anti-Semitism. Again, anti-Torah, those who have changed God's festivals into pagan holidays and Hellenistic practices, even have changed the holy convocation of Passover into something called Easter, which finds its roots in paganism, those who believe in replacement theology, that God is finished with the Jews, that the church is now the new Israel. Or in other words, the church of Constantine. And we see a lot of that today, unfortunately. The second category, a toshav a sojourner, or a transient, someone who's just passing through, compared to a hired wage earner looking for personal profit. Could very well mean people today, even Christians, even TV evangelists who exploit Judaism to make a quick buck. Yeah. Who aren't really lovers of Israel, but take advantage of the Jewish thing because it's popular to do so. In reality, a hireling. But then we come to a gear. Everybody go, yay! yay. yay. A gear who is grafted into the olive tree of Israel and delights in it, who loves the Jewish people, who love God's Torah, who has the heart of Ruth and who says, wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. How many of you like this third category the best? Oh, yeah. Amen. And how many of you, again, are glad to be grafted in to the Messianic Jewish community? It's all because of this people. Let's give them all the praise. Let's dig a little deeper. Because it is true that the Torah stipulates in verse 48 that if a ger and his household want to participate in a Passover, he too must consent to circumcision. But this too requires a deeper analysis. I had to underline the word Passover several times in those verses because the term translated as Passover in these verses read in Hebrew, Pesach, Pesach. And that is a term which specifically applies to the Passover lamb itself, its slaughter, and its consumption. Thus, the Torah literally does prohibit an uncircumcised person, Jew or non-Jew, from sacrificing the Passover lamb and then eating it. However, they could still keep the Passover Seder and the entire Feast of Unleavened Bread they just couldn't sacrifice a lamb or eat it. Even if they were uncircumcised, they could still eat unleavened bread, the bitter herbs, and participate in all the other aspects of a Passover Seder. The Talmud concurs with this in Tractate Pesachim 96a, where it says, He, meaning the uncircumcised, shall not eat of it, meaning the Passover lamb, but he may eat unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. And by the way, the eating of the bitter herbs is one of our favorite parts of the Seder. Amen? <laughs> so now, we're putting all this into uh, perspective here. This means now that non-Jewish and non-circumcised believers are more than welcome at the Seder table according to the Torah. And they should partake of the matzah and the bitter herbs and the four cups, the cup of sanctification, which represents when Hashem separated the Israelites unto himself, the cup of judgment, which represents the 10 plagues that he inflicted upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians, the cup of redemption, which points toward the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant, and the cup of the kingdom, Yeshua spoke of that cup when he said, 
I will not drink of this cup until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. That's speaking about the wedding supper of the Lamb. All of this will be explained further at the Seder. But we all should partake of the matzah, the bitter herbs, the four cups, and the whole seven-day festival with a glad and a joyful heart. Passover is even known as the season of our rejoicing, the season of our freedom. There is no prohibition except in regards to the sacrificed lamb itself. And guess what? Without a temple, there is not a sacrifice because Deuteronomy 16, verse 2, forbids it. And by the way, that is why we don't serve lamb at our Passover Seder. But here's some more good news. How many of you want to hear some good news? Amen. Jewish or non-Jewish, circumcised and uncircumcised believers can all together share and rejoice in our one common Passover lamb. His name is Yeshua. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Where would we be if it wasn't for Yeshua? Hallelujah. And because of him, we can all celebrate Monday night. We can all celebrate and be glad and rejoice in this great feast of Pesach. Somebody say, it's all about Yeshua. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, let's stand up and let's give him some praise right now. Hallelujah. Let's get vocal and let's get animated. Lift up your hands and let's bless the Lord, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Lord Yeshua, we lift you up. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory, all the honor. You alone are worthy to be praised. The Lamb who was slain, we thank you that with your blood you have redeemed us. We thank you that with your blood you have made us all one. We thank you, hallelujah, that it's all because of you, Yeshua, that we've been brought out of darkness into your marvelous light. We give you all praise and all glory. We, as we ascribe all, all that glory to you and to you alone. You are the king. You are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the Lamb of God. You are the Lion of Judah who hath prevailed. And we thank you that we too are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And we give testimony that Yeshua is Lord of all to the glory of God the Father. Let's give him another great big clap. Now this really is kind of an in-depth teaching because, you know, we're subject to a lot of things that we hear out there. And this is the point. There are believers within the Torah movement. They take God's Torah seriously. But they believe by certain scriptures that they're not allowed to participate in a Passover Seder. But we're clearing that up today. You are allowed to participate in the Passover Seder. And God wants you to participate in that Passover Seder. And He wants you to be joyous, and He wants you to be glad, and He wants you to celebrate. Hallelujah. And remember again, it's all pointing toward, it's a rehearsal, pointing toward the wedding supper of the Lamb. Who's looking forward to being at the wedding supper of the Lamb? Hallelujah. God loves the unity. Psalm 133 says, Hine matovu manayim shevet achim gam yachad. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew and to the Gentile. Again, Romans 11, Gentiles are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. Paul goes on in Galatians 3, 26 through 29, when he says, For you are all, all sons of God through faith in the Messiah. In him there is neither Jew nor Gentile. You are all Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Ephesians 2, 14 says that the Messiah has broken down the middle wall of partition. And Ephesians 2, 19, Paul says, Gentiles are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with the Jewish people who share in the commonwealth of Israel. Amen. In Matthew 10, verse 6, and in Matthew 15, verse 24, it's true, Yeshua did say, 
I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But he did add in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 16, and other sheep, meaning Gentiles, I must also bring, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Hallelujah. Let me just read to you, and let's remain standing. These words of Yeshua in John 17, verse 20 through 22. Father, I do not pray for these alone, meaning his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Yeshua prayed that prayer on the very night of Passover before his death. How many of you today want to be the answer to the Messiah's prayer? Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Let's have the worship team come back up and if we can find this song, Father, may they be one on the overhead. And again, to further establish unity that we're all one in the side. Let's see if we can kind of move in toward each other. Let's hold hands, grab hands together. As one body, one bride, one people, redeemed by the blood of Yeshua.
I think we're supposed to do another song. <laughs> we'll go out rejoicing. Amen?
please remember um, the meeting after the uh, ONEG and Shabbat Shalom. Praise the Lord. Remember, you can still sign up for the Passover Seder. If you need to, you can see Anna Maria.